This is lecture one for biology 178 on the spinal cord. We finished off in the last class talking about the central nervous system, looking at the brain specifically. We'll now continue with the spinal cord. The spinal cord and spinal nerves form the simplest part of the central nervous system. Functional and structural relationships here are very easy to understand. The anterior part of the spinal cord, for instance, is motor and the dorsal portion or the dorsal portion is sensory. Both the brain and spinal cord receive sensory input from receptors, contain reflex centers and send motor output to effectors. But the spinal cord simply does so in a much simpler pathway. Now, structurally, the spinal cord is approximately 18 inches or 45 centimeters long. It will obviously be a little bit longer given the height or vertebral column length of the individual. The spinal cord itself speaks to the neurological structure that runs the length of your vertebral column. So I'm not just talking about the bones. Remember, the bones are the vertebral column and the spinal cord are the nerves that actually run inside of the bones. The spinal cord itself actually ends between L1 to L2 of the vertebral column. But we do use some of these same vertebral column segment names to uh, signify spinal cord segments. They are not the same as far as an L1 being the same L1 on the vertebral column, but they're named in the same pattern. So the spinal cord is divided into 31 segments, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal. So you can see that it's going to be very much similar to a vertebral column, with the exceptions being one additional cervical nerve uh, as per vertebrae, uh, as with the vertebrae, and then five sacral and one coccygeal. So adding that on. Now, the spinal nerves are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that come out from each portion of the spinal cord segment. So it's going to match each one. It's identified by the association with the adjacent vertebrae. So the cervical region is C1 through C8, thoracic is T1 through T12, and the lumbar is L1 through L5. There are six total in the sacral and coccygeal region. So here's a breakdown showing you an actual diagram of the spinal cord regions. Remember there's eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral with one coccygeal at the very end. You can see here where the spinal cord actually ends between L1 to L2, but nerves keep extending out beyond that, going all the way down towards the sacral and coccygeal region of the, ver of the vertebral column. Now, some additional anatomy on the spinal cord. The conus medullaris is actually going to be the tapered cone-shaped end of the spinal cord found at the inferior end to the lumbar enlargement. The caudia equina is going to be a collection of dorsal and ventral roots of spinal segments from L2 to S5 along with the filium terminale that we'll talk about next. The name of caudia equina comes from the resemblance to a horse's tail. The filium terminale we won't exactly see in the next diagram, but it is known as the terminal thread. This is a slender strand of fibrous tissue extending from the inferior tip of the conus medullaris to the second sacral vertebrae. The filium terminale itself is not nerve tissue like the caudia equina or conus medullaris. It is actually a form of connective tissue that is going to provide longitudinal support to the spinal cord. So here we can see a posterior view of the spinal cord with all those spinal nerve segments extending out. Note the different regions of cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. We can also see a cervical enlargement and a lumbar enlargement. The enlargements are actually due to the fact that this is where the nerves will branch out to go to some of the different appendages. The cervical enlargement will eventually branch out and become the brachial plexus. The lumbar enlargement is larger as more nerves branch down into the sacrum, hips, and down the legs. Now, the conus medullaris we can see happens at L1 to L2. This is going to actually be the very end of the spinal cord, the structural end. 
The cauda equina is simply where these nerves fan out and project inferiorly. The filium terminale is actually labeled down where the coccyx is, but it's going to simply be a layer of connective tissue that connects the conus medullaris all the way down to the end of the sacrum, providing longitudinal support. Now, we talked about these when we talked about the brain being one of the layers of protection. And remember that they extend all the way down from the brain across the spinal cord. So these are the spinal meninges. This is a series of specialized membranes that surround the spinal cord and provide physical stability and shock absorption. There are blood vessels within the layers that deliver oxygen and nutrients to the spinal cord. Additionally, the wrapping of them helps to keep the cerebral spinal fluid in. These are continuous with the cranial meninges as already stated, and they are the same three layers, the dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. Here we can see a diagram of the dura matter as it's pulled back from the spinal cord to reveal the arachnoid matter and the pia matter. Now remember, these are the same sort of organization as they are in the brain. Now, there are a few spaces in between some of these layers. The first is the subarachnoid space. This attaches the arachnoid matter to the pia matter, and it is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. This acts as a shock absorption and diffusion medium for gases, nutrients, chemical messengers, and wastes. So this layer is very important in housing that cerebral spinal fluid. Now there's also the epidural space. The epidural space is actually between the dura matter and the walls of the vertebral canal. This is going to contain areolar tissue, blood vessels, and adipose tissue. Here we can see an excellent view of the cross sections of the spinal cord, including the different layers of the meninges. Note the spinal cord with a fine white layer around it. This is the pia matter. From there, we extend out to the subarachnoid space. This is also where the arachnoid matter would be. Remember that arachnoid matter is actually going to be like spiderweb branches that would be in the subarachnoid space and simply is there to provide structural support. The space itself is going to house that cerebral spinal fluid. From there, we move out to the dura matter, which is going to be a thick, tough layer that surrounds all of the, nerve, the central nervous system. And then from there, you can see we kind of get to this layer of what looks like packing peanuts. That's actually going to be adipose tissue and makes up the epidural space. The epidural space creates a little separation between the actual bone and nerve. And this area is going to be lined with adipose and areolar or loose connective tissue to stabilize the spinal cord and prevent any sort of uh, forceful, uh, forceful impact on it. So remember when I said epidural space, I'm sure you've probably heard that term before, especially in a lot of medical shows, but the epidural space is an area, like I said, that contains areolar connective tissue and adipose tissue. It is also a space used for injections of anesthetics, like an epidural block that affects nearby spinal nerves and uh, other local sensory anesthesia. Spinal taps or lumbar punctures are performed via a long needle in the large arachnoid space just below L2, where the spinal cord splits into the numerous endings of the caudia equina. Here, they can actually inject through the epidural space and into the actual dura matter in the subarachnoid space in order to actually get some of the cerebral spinal fluid and sample it. We're now going to look at the cross-sectional anatomy of the individual spinal cord now that we've looked at the gross anatomy of the spinal cord. The cross-sectional anatomy shows us that we have a very distinct butterfly-like shape in the center of the spinal cord. This is going to be the gray matter. The superficial layer on the outside is the white matter. The white matter, remember, contains large numbers of myelinated and unmyelinated axons. The deep gray matter layer is going to be dominated by cell bodies of neurons, neuroglia, and unmyelinated axons, and it's going to surround a small central canal. The central canal houses ependymial cells and cerebral spinal fluid. This forms that H or butterfly shape. Here we can see a sectional overview of the spinal cord, including the gray matter, white matter, and many of the anatomical landmarks.
Take note of the left half of this sectional view and notice some of the important landmarks that we'll cover in subsequent slides. The posterior gray horn, the lateral gray horn, and the anterior gray horn. These are going to be different protrusions of gray matter. They are connected from the left side to the right side by the gray commissure, which is divided into the anterior and posterior. The hole in the center of the spinal cord is the central canal, and it has different invaginations on either side, the posterior median sulcus and the anterior median fissure. On the right side, we can actually see the functional organization of gray matter into the sensory and motor nuclei and whether it's somatic or visceral. Looking at the gray matter structurally, we have the three different horns, the posterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, and anterior gray horn. Each of these horns are actually going to house a specific type of nuclei that is and these nuclei are going to function in transmitting very specific signals. The posterior gray horn is going to house sensory nuclei for both somatic and visceral. So it's going to deal with all sensation that comes into the spinal cord. The lateral gray horn is going to deal with visceral motor nuclei. The anterior gray horn is going to deal with somatic motor nuclei. And then remember the gray commissure consists of axons that cross from one side to the other. Crossing over in the nervous system is called decusation. Now, looking at the functional organization of gray matter, we have nuclei. Nuclei are functional groups of cell bodies of neurons in the gray matter of the spinal cord. They are often grouped by region. We have sensory and motor nuclei. Remember that sensory receives and relays sensory information. This is also known as afferent. Motor nuclei issue motor commands to peripheral effectors. So this is efferent. Here we can see the diagram again. We can see the posterior gray horn, lateral gray horn, and anterior gray horn. I want you to take note of the white line that we've used to section off the spinal cord. This is dividing anterior or ventral from posterior or dorsal. This is going to show us that there is a clear distinction in organization in the spinal cord on whether it is sensory or motor. Here, the anterior is dealing all with motor, whereas the posterior is dealing all with sensory. The motor is divided into visceral and somatic, with the visceral being the lateral gray horn and the somatic being the anterior gray horn. The sensory nuclei are going to both be in the posterior gray horn, both somatic and visceral. The term somatic means body or more voluntary. So if we think sensory uh, somatic, this is going to simply refer to being able to feel something touch us or being more consciously aware of it. Visceral would be something like your blood pressure receptors or internal temperature receptors of your blood. This is going to be visceral. So any sort of internal organs deal with visceral, the outside or periphery is gonna be somatic. Let's give you an example of that with motor. In motor, visceral might be activating a gland or a digestive organ. Motor for somatic would be activating a skeletal muscle, getting it to contract. Now, looking at the structural organization of white matter, the white matter is divided into three columns on each side of the spinal cord, posterior, lateral, and anterior. These columns are actually going to contain tracks, bundles of axons. Remember that these are simply going to be like wires that relay information. All axons in a track convey the same information in the same direction, and they're both ascending and descending tracks, whether it's sensory or motor. The anterior and posterior white commissures are going to interconnect with white columns. Here we can see an organization of how the white matter is categorized. Remember again, the spinal cord, if we divide it in half, the posterior aspect will be sensory and the anterior aspect will be motor. Here we can see the anterior or the posterior, the lateral and the anterior white columns. We can also see the organization of tracks in the posterior white matter and some examples of where they actually service. So the leg, hip, trunk, arm, these are gonna be relays that would come in through this area. Whereas in the gray matter, we can relay that information out via the effector in the same, the same organization, trunk, shoulder, arm, forearm, and hand. You do not need to memorize these for the test.
You do need to know the white columns and where they are though. We now are moving on from the spinal cord into the spinal nerves. Remember that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that are associated with adjacent vertebrae, the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. These spinal nerves are going to then innervate the rest of the body as peripheral nerves. Each nerve contains a huge number of axons with blood vessels and connective tissue. Here we can see a nerve and the different layers that make it up. You'll notice it actually looks very similar to a muscle. That should make it a little bit easier to learn. The layering names are very much the same with the same prefix, epi, peri, endo. They just have a different suffix, nurium, meaning nerve. The outermost layer is called the epineurium. This is a dense irregular connective tissue that covers the entire nerve. From there, we move in and have different fascicles, which is a bundle of neuron axons. This will be covered by the perineurium which is also going to be a layer of kind of dense irregular connective tissue. The endoneurium is a delicate layer of connective tissue that surrounds a neuron itself. And then there is endoneurial fluid that is actually going to be inside of this area that kind of lubricates the passageways, so to speak. It's similar to CSF as well. This is a piece of delicious apple pecan pie. Mm. Actually planning on going to Julian at some point this summer. So looking forward to having a piece of this. Mm. Now, if we consider the spinal cord with the ventral or anterior and the dorsal or posterior, we now can branch out from that to understand the spinal nerve organization. Spinal nerves contain axons of sensory and motor neurons. From the spinal cord itself, we have roots that extend off both the ventral and dorsal. These roots, the ventral root and the dorsal root are gonna contain different axons. The ventral root is gonna contain axons of motor neurons. The dorsal root contains axons of sensory neurons. Those cell bodies are actually going to be in the dorsal root ganglion. The dorsal root ganglion would be the next immediate branch of the dorsal root. The term ganglion refers to a collection of cell bodies. So this will actually look like a chubbier portion of the nerve, like it has a slight bulge to it. This is because it has a cell body. And if we think of a neuron, the neuron has the long skinny axon with the larger star-shaped cell body. This larger cell body is going to be what is present in ganglions. Each spinal cord segment has a pair of dorsal ganglia on each side. A ganglia is a plural of a ganglion. Here we can see the spinal cord with the spinal nerves branching off. Note the ventral root, note the dorsal root, where they come off. They're gonna actually go right in from the gray matter and we can see where those tracks would be. The dorsal root ganglion is actually going to be that little bulge that we see that extends off from the dorsal root. From there, the dorsal root ganglion would then merge with the ventral root to form the spinal nerve. At the spinal nerve, we actually have both sensory and motor information crossing over. The ventral root is going to be motor only. The dorsal root and dorsal root ganglion are sensory only. From the spinal nerve, we now get to branch into different divisions. These are called rami. A singular would be ramus. The term rami or ramus means arm-like or bend. The dorsal ramus is going to innervate muscles, joints, and skin of the back. The ventral ramus is going to innervate structures in the upper and lower limbs and the lateral and anterior trunk. We also have the communicating rami. These will be present in the thoracic and superior lumbar region and contain axons of the sympathetic neurons and the autonomic nervous system. So here we can see the further organization of the spinal cord. Again, that dorsal root to dorsal root ganglion merges with the, sp uh, the ventral root to form the spinal nerve. From the spinal nerve, it then branches off to the dorsal ramus to the back, the ventral ramus out to the sides and down the limbs, and the communicating rami, which runs the length of the thoracic and upper lumbar spinal, uh, spinal cord. This is going to then branch off into the sympathetic ganglion and autonomic nerves. This primarily deals with autonomic nervous system related things being 
the visceral organs, so a lot of your digestive organs and glands. Now we're gonna look a little bit at spinal nerve distribution and how motor and sensory commands are issued. First, a motor command originates in a motor nuclei, that is, in the ventral portion of the spinal cord. It will travel along the ventral root of each spinal nerve. From there, the ventral and dorsal roots join to form a spinal nerve, and then to the dorsal ramus, if it needs to go to the back, the ventral ramus, if it needs to go to the body surface, walls, or limbs, or to the rami communicantes to convey sympathetic motor commands via sympathetic ganglions. This can be to issue different commands to the digestive system. Now, I want to simplify this picture and I'm gonna take you through each colored line. Let's start with the red line. The red line is gonna start and originate at the somatic motor nucleus. The somatic motor nucleus will issue a command and then it will travel out via the ventral root. From the ventral root, it will pass through the spinal nerve. From the spinal nerve, it could branch off into one of two locations. To the dorsal ramus, if I wanna flex my back muscles, or to the ventral ramus, maybe I wanna flex my arm or my chest. So that's how a somatic motor nucleus command works. Let's now move to the blue line the ventral motor nucleus. The ventral motor nuclei will issue a command. This will again travel down the ventral root, through the spinal nerve, and then down the rami communicantes and into the sympathetic ganglion and down through the sympathetic or autonomic nerve. This will then innervate through the abdominal pelvic viscera. Maybe it will activate the stomach to produce more hydrochloric acid. So that's an example of how the visceral motor nuclei works. It's going to transmit itself down into the viscera or organs. I now want to take a look at that black line there. That black line, notice, doesn't originate in the visceral or somatic motor nuclei. It originates in the sympathetic ganglion. And that's because this is your sympathetic nervous system at work. This is that fight or flight response. The sympathetic ganglion would issue a command and have innervation directly with the brain based upon stimuli coming in. So in this case, let's say a tiger comes into the door. All of a sudden tiger comes in, you're gonna feel immediate shock. Chills are gonna run down your spine. You are activating your sympathetic nervous system and sympathetic ganglions. The sympathetic ganglion activates and it sends out different effects to different parts of the body. It will travel through the rami communicantes into the dorsal ramus to activate the different smooth muscles or glands of the back, maybe sweat glands of the back. It will turn around and activate the ventral ramus where it will activate the same thing, different sweat glands there. It will start to open up blood vessels to be able to be ready and get more blood into the muscles of your arms and legs to be able to run or fight the tiger. And finally, it will move its way down into the smooth muscles, glands, and visceral organs in the thoracic cavity, maybe slowing down digestion. So that way it doesn't impede your ability to fight or flight. And this is how different motor commands work in the spinal cord. Let's now talk a little bit about sensory information. Sensory information is going to be collected from the periphery and then delivered to the spinal cord. So this is going to work backwards from the actual motor commands. Here, afferent nerves are going to carry sensory information from the body or the sympathetic nerves from the visceral organs. They will travel via the ventral ramus if it's carrying information from the body surface, body walls, and limbs. From the dorsal ramus if it's going to be from the back or skin of the back and then it'll travel into the dorsal root of each of these spinal nerves that is gonna carry sensory information to the spinal cord. Let's take a look at this. So here, I'm gonna cover each one of the lines. I'm actually gonna start with the red line. Now the red line could start from either the back or from the front. Let's start with going down the dorsal ramus, the exterior and proprioceptors of the back. Somebody touches my back. Well, that information is going to travel eventually to the dorsal ramus, to the spinal nerve, to the dorsal root ganglion, to the dorsal root, and then finally into the somatic sensory nuclei. So that's going to then relay the information that my back was touched.
The same thing would be true of if somebody touched my arm. Here, from the exterior receptors, proprioceptors of the body, wall, and limbs, it would travel to the ventral ramus, to the spinal nerve, to the dorsal root ganglion, and then to the somatic sensory nuclei. So really the same thing. Visceral is going to work a little bit different. Here it can come from one of three locations. Interior receptors of the back, or of the body, wall, and limbs, or of the visceral organs. Here I actually want to start from the visceral organs. I'm receiving information from my blood vessels on blood pressure that might relay its way up. Here, it's going to go from the sympathetic nerve to the sympathetic ganglion, to the rami communicantes, to the spinal nerve, to the dorsal root ganglion, to the visceral sensory nuclei. Interior receptors are going to be different things that might be in sweat glands or things like that. And this could be relayed information. Maybe I feel something brush on my arm in a very weird way that activates some of the uh, general receptors in there. And it would travel in the same pathway of going ventral ramus, spinal nerve, dorsal root ganglion, and then into the visceral sensory nuclei. So we can see this pathway and the different ways that it can go through these different structures.